Stephanie is not only happy because she's at NASA and, and in space heaven, but she's also in her home state. I am, and there's a special smell about Florida. I don't know if everyone else smells it or just us Floridians, but it just brings you back to your childhood. And of course, we used to watch shuttles launch all the time. You could go outside basically anywhere in South Florida and see these puppies take off. Well, all morning long, we have an exclusive behind the scenes look at the new Space Shuttle Atlantis exhibit opening later this month at the Kennedy Space Center. Right now, Stephanie is standing by live with the COO of the Visitor's Center, yes. Mr. Bill Moore. That's right. Bill Moore was kind enough to wake up early. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure meeting Thank you. Thank you very June much. June 29th is when this officially opens, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. So if you guys hear any drilling in the background, that's because we're still trying to get it ready. Last minute turn and burn to get ready to go. I like it. Now, Atlantis is the only shuttle that's on display to be open like this, to be exposed like this. Why did you make that decision to do that? Well, it started with a story. We wanted our guests to come see what it might feel like to be in space as an astronaut. Mm -hmm. Very few of us that have that experience. This Atlantis will get you as close as you can get, being here on Earth. What was it like to be in space? Payload bay doors open, K-band antenna out, just like they saw when they were on, on orbit. You can literally almost touch this thing and still see the scars from when it came That's back right. to Earth. When Atlantis landed in final flight at 135, she looks just like she does today. Every little strike and mark on there from re-entry is all there. So what else can you do? Because they don't let you inside the space shuttle. Trust me, I asked if I could get in there. <laughs> what else can you do in the exhibit here? Well, it's amazing. We tell a lot of stories, but we have 62 interactive exhibits. So you can go down and learn what it's like to move the Can Canada arm. You can go in and see what it's like to dock with the space station. You, you can go in and do all the things that astronauts did and simulate that. In addition to that, you can see the Hubble exhibit and the exhibit on ISS. And we have two Americans in orbit today. Very nice. This is not funded through taxpayers' dollars. No, we work hard. We develop our own source of revenue. We partner with NASA, and we're able to do amazing exhibits like that. No cost to the taxpayers at all. Okay, so when people come through, what do you want them to take away from this exhibit? I think they need to understand how unique the shuttle was. It did mm -hmm. stories that no other vehicle has been able to do. You know, Hubble has sent back amazing pictures today. They're still asking questions about how our universe was formed, only possible with the space shuttle. Yeah. That's what we want them to understand and remember. Uniqueness of the vehicle, what it's like to be in space, and how important our space program is to this country. Bill, are you sure I can't get inside that thing? You know, I've tried. I've actually gotten in it before on the ground, uh, but not like that. There's nobody so, here. No one knows. I know. I just got to find the keys, right? Okay, you go find those. Oh, we'll go I'll find those. Doing the Sounds weather. great. Thank you, Thank so, you much. so much. I appreciate Thanks it. Thanks for coming to see us. Al, you know I'm going to try my hardest to get in that thing. Yeah, behind me is Atlantis, but Endeavor, Endeavor Columbia, uh, Challenger, and Discovery all launched from here. There's five space shuttles, 135 launches. So the question is, how did they get this, well, along with its rockets, 4.5 million pounds into space? Here's a look. I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the Earth. Since 1968, Kennedy Space Center has been used as the sole U.S. launch site for every NASA human space flight. That's one small step for man. A rich history told through the courageous men and women who have pushed science and technology to the brink, including astronaut Bob Springer. So where exactly are we standing? What is this facility? What are we overlooking here? This is the Launch Control Center, and okay. it's just adjacent to uh, the assembly building for the uh, the vehicle assembly building where we put the components together. But inside of here, uh, ac across several floors, are different launch control complexes. Our cameras were invited inside for a rare look. A lot of people might be surprised that Mission Control is in Houston. Lift up on Apollo 11. Bob, we're here on the launch pad. What is it like when you're sitting on the launch pad? Because you're there for a good three hours before you take off. Well, you are, and that's where you realize it has all come together. All the frustration, all the time that you spent, uh, all the emotion that you put into it. And the only thing you're really worried about is don't anything go wrong that would stop the count. You want to lift off. I mean, the, I, I can't imagine there have been crews who have had gone out there, gotten down to one second before launch and scrub. And, scrub. and I'm like, that has to be the hardest thing to do. One thing that could delay the launch? 
the weather, of course. Let's talk about the weather because there are so many weather parameters when you're out here. It's a beautiful day. Would you be able to launch on a day like this? Today, yeah, it's a great launch day. Uh, fairly calm winds uh, and uh, no real problems with it. Of course, you have to be concerned about uh, not only the clouds, the winds, uh, uh, lightning within the, uh, the local area. It's something that most people don't realize because we have to protect against what we call our abort modes. If we get an engine failure right after takeoff, we come back and land back here at the Cape. So the weather's got to be satisfactory for landing. It also has to be satisfactory to protect against what we call our transatlantic abort, landing in, in Spain at, one, at some of our abort sites. California so, too, or, right? or California. Another interesting fact about Kennedy Space Center, bet you didn't know there is a giant lightning rod on top of the launch pad. We have to have a big lightning rod up there to protect the electronics on the on the orbiter. Okay. And uh, it works, so we we've, we've go through it in a huge extent. But yeah, it's, it's the world's biggest lightning rod up there as, uh, as far as that goes. Now, with the shuttle Atlantis permanently on display, it's an opportunity to not only respect our space history, but bring a renewed opportunity to dream of our space future. And I think we're entering a really, really exciting era in terms of spaceflight. It's exciting for us uh, who have been there. It's exciting for this next generation, the kids who are out there who are studying these subjects in school. It, it's just going to open that door to so many more opportunities. It's really exciting, uh, an unlimited future. We're all excited about the program here and the shuttle out it's 122 feet in length there and its wingspan is 78 feet. Well, the Kennedy Space Center is debuting a new $100 million home to the Space Shuttle Atlantis as we've been telling you. Staff has been there all day uh, for an exclusive behind the scenes look and had to be awfully cool Steph. It is really cool and we were able to go to the launch control center. We went to the launch pad and of course we're here in front of Space Shuttle Atlantis. The only shuttle to be displayed like this in 360 degrees with those payload bay doors open. So let's talk about what has happened here at Kennedy Space Center and also the future of space with the director of the Kennedy Space Center, Bob Cabana. Thanks for being with us this oh, morning. My pleasure, Stephanie. We appreciate this is cool. it. Day and night launches here. All 135 of the five different shuttles took off from Kennedy Space Center. So what now? Well, uh, you know, the shuttle had a phenomenal 30-year history, and this is a fantastic display of what it's accomplished. But we're moving into the future, and the future for NASA is exploring beyond planet Earth. And we're building a big rocket. We're modifying our northernmost launch pad to accommodate the space launch system with the Orion crew vehicle on top of it. We're building the first one of those right now for a test flight next year. Um, the rocket is going to actually launch in 17. We're going to launch the capsule on a, on a smaller rocket just to get a test flight on it. And we're also enabling commercial operations here at the Cape. We want to be a multi-user spaceport that supports both government and commercial flights, crew and cargo. Our commercial crew program is getting a vehicle to get our crews to the International Space Station and there's three companies competing for that, Sierra Nevada, uh, SpaceX and Boeing and in the end one of those will win a contract to fly our crews to the space station. So there is a lot going on and on top of that we're trying to enable commercial operations here for uh, other flights. So will the launch control center and also mission control in Houston, will those still play a part in these launches? Absolutely. As, well specifically for the, uh, the space launch system when we go exploring and the mission that we're shooting for right now, uh, the first test flight in 2017 with a crew in 2021 and the president, president challenged us to go to an asteroid and what we're working on now is an asteroid retrieval mission. And that's going to, we're studying it this year and defining it. And we would send a, a vehicle out to capture a small that had asteroid. That Ben Affleck on it. And, and, no, uh, no, no, no. It was a little different, a little okay, different. Okay, a little Much different. Much smaller, solar electric <laughs> pro, uh, power, totally autonomous uh, rendezvous operations. Grab this asteroid, bring it back to what's called a Lagrange point between the Earth and the Moon, where it can sit for 100 years. And then we'd fly our SLS with our Orion crew vehicle to the asteroid. So it's, it's cool. really a neat mission, very challenging. You but eventually we want to go to Mars. That's our goal. 20, 30 time frame, we want to get to Mars. How about back to the moon? Well, do you think we'll go there and do a little you development? Know, we'll see. We'll see how it all sorts out. Right now, everything that we're doing on this asteroid retrieval mission is developing the skills and testing out the vehicle and getting what we need for eventually going to Mars one day. Um, I think humans are going to go back to the moon, absolutely. And whether it's a government or a commercial flight, well, we'll have to see. But, uh, you know, it'll happen. But the ultimate destination is boots on Mars. There's still plenty of jobs at NASA because a lot of people were concerned about oh, people Oh, absolutely. Lost uh, we're hiring. And uh, I just read in Forbes magazine that uh, among engineering students, NASA is like the number one uh, choice, best place to, uh, to work.
You hear that, kids? And plenty of astronauts still needed, right? In fact, we're in the process uh, of uh, selecting, announcing uh, a new group here uh, very shortly. So you're saying I have a chance? Yeah, always a chance. You need a meteorologist <laughs> up there, don't you? <laughs> you? You got a technical degree, right? <laughs> <laughs> I guess we'll call it that. Uh, thank you so much, Bob. My I pleasure. appreciate it. Now, what about the future? What will we be launching off in the future? Joining us now is Ed Mango, the program manager of the Commercial Crew Program. Ed, thanks for being with us this morning. Exactly what is the Commercial Crew Program? See, the Commercial Crew Program is our next NASA partnership with industry to go mm -hmm. put uh, Americans back into space on our U.S. rockets. So how are we going to go about doing that? Today we have uh, three partners, uh, Boeing, uh, Sierra Nevada Corporation, and SpaceX. All three are building designs and starting to do uh, initial testing. Um, one, we'll pick one or more of those designs to continue to go forward with and eventually certify one of those uh, designs to take our astronauts to the space station. What will those shuttles, I don't know if you'll call them that, well, what will they look like? Let's see, uh, two of them, the Boeing uh, design and the SpaceX design, are more like capsules, smaller capsules than what we did in Apollo and definitely smaller. Smaller than, than Apollo? Yes. Wow, those are um, tight. <laughs> well, smaller because we have to get the space station only. Uh, so the back end is a little bit smaller than they were on, on Apollo, a little bit smaller than Orion. Their purpose is really to go to space station, uh, drop off crew, our crew and the international crew, and also to bring the crew back, also act as an emergency vehicle in case they have to come home. What about going to Mars and going to the moon and trying to live on these two places? A uh, very good question. Our, our commercial crew program is all as a piece of the puzzle about trying to go do exploration. We, or this design and this effort, is all about low Earth orbit. That's in the first 300 miles of the Earth. Um, the Orion vehicle is going to go way beyond. It's the one that's going to go to the moon, an asteroid, or Mars. That vehicle can go way beyond low Earth orbit. When will all of this happen? Well, we would hope it happens as soon as possible. Somewhere, we'll start flying test crews probably in 2016, 2017 time frame. We'll be certified and ready to go to space station by 2020. When, or, I'm sorry, by 2017. When will, you know, I'd love to go to space. I know a lot of people watching would love to go to space. When do you think we'll have that opportunity? I think the opportunity is just right around the corner. In fact, uh, all of our partners are going to have more than uh, four seats. We require four okay, folks. Okay, when will do. it be affordable for affordable. those of us to go to space? Yes. Um, I think we'll see how the market goes. It depends what your <laughs> affordability scale is. I That's think. That's true. Everything's <laughs> relative. Yes. I mean, what do you think it'll be? You know, three hundred bucks. Like we, you know, now can get a ticket. You think that's pretty far uh, off in I the think future. That's way far off in the future. And where will they launch from? I know that you guys have um, redone one of your launch pads here. All 135 of the shuttles took off from here. Will it be the same with the new uh, shuttles? Yes, all three of our vehicles. Again, there's two capsules and one a blended body like a shuttle, mini shuttle. Mm -hmm. uh, all of them will be flying right here from the Cape, whether they're flying from the Air Force side of the Cape, because we have some pads on the Air Force side, or from LC-39. I think it's all still in the trade space for these designs, but all of them will be flying right Right here from Central so Florida. it's a it's a combo of the government and commercial. Yes, it's very good for the taxpayers because uh, usually the government pays 100% us taxpayers. Now we're not paying 100%. The companies are expected to put money on the table as well, and they are. They're very well putting yeah. quite a lot of money on the table, and that helps all of us save a little bit of tax money. It also helps them with other business. Yeah. So again, plenty uh, of jobs for other, everybody. Other folks can get in the space. Yeah. You know, in, in terms of tourists, I think that might be a little while. But All in right. terms of researchers, <laughs> <laughs> maybe you can go because researchers for weather, researchers for the planet, researchers for microgravity, all those kind of folks yeah. really need to get up to low Earth orbit and use uh, zero gravity or right. low Earth orbit. Thank you so much. I appreciate Thank it. You. As a kid, myself and Mike, who is my co-anchor, we were talking about, we both wanted to work for NASA and go into space. So, Bettis, did you hear that? They need researchers. There's, you and I, I'm going to get us a ticket <laughs> to be researchers. Hope. They are opening a new exhibit with the Space Shuttle Land which you can see behind me, and an astronaut that was on this space shuttle who's joining us now is Tom Jones, and we want to nice show to everyone you, your pretty face. Thanks for being with us this morning. Uh, let's first talk about the weather and the shuttle, because weather actually scrubbed one of your launches. What type of weather and how long were you stuck in there? Um, my very first flight was on Endeavour, uh -huh. and we were stuck for five hours on our backs in the cabin facing up. It was very frustrating because we could see through the front windows it was blue sky but we had high winds and that meant for an emergency landing coming back into the Cape, it violated the performance limits of the shuttle. So we couldn't take off because we might have to do an emergency landing and it was not gonna be within our wind limits. So we had to wait till the next day when the winds died down a bit. It's gotta be frustrating. So talk about the flight deck real quick here yeah. before we go along the shuttle. It's pretty small. 
Flight deck is like an airliner flight deck, a cockpit. It's got two front seats for the test pilots, the commander and the pilot. Mm -hmm. And then right behind them, I sat in the flight engineer's seat on uh, my Columbia mission. Next to me is another mission specialist. And the four of us worked as a team to control the ship during launch and landing. And downstairs, of course, there's more seating for the rest of the crew. Okay, so let's talk about this beautiful ship as we walk along it. It is massive. What is it like to get up there and you're sitting and, you, you know, you hear the main engines and then solid rock, everything just lifts off. What is yeah, that like? It's a magical process, very exhilarating because, you know, this this 80 ton machine plus the rest of the fuel and the boosters are zinging you off the pad. Big bang, big vibration. Uh, you're squeezed back into your seat with triple Gs? the force of gravity. Three Gs? Three, three Gs for the last minute. And so you know that this machine is hurtling you into space on this fantastic physics experiment. And so Atlantis is taking you on the rod of your life. Yeah. And it really is a phenomenal, uh, unforgettable experience. Did that four times. Did you ever get sick when you were in space when you first felt yeah. that weightlessness? Because yeah. apparently it does affect a lot of people. About half of the people get some sense of uh, stomach awareness or nausea. And on my first trip, got uh, sick, but we have medicines to take care of that. Cured it in a snap, and then I felt fine. And on the rest of my trips, I always took that medicine on the launch pad before blast off, <laughs> no, so I never felt it again. Well, that's good to know. You know, Mike, uh, back one of my co-anchors back at work, he wants to know about the food. Yeah. and what it was like in space. Uh, camping food, think of a backpacking trip, and that's yeah. really what it's like. It's like camping out for two or three weeks in space on that little cabin up there. And you know, you've got everything from freeze-dried foods to army rations, those MREs yeah. that come in the foil pouch. You know, at NASA, they, they stand for not MR, MRE, meals ready to eat. Uh -huh. At NASA, it's meals rejected by everyone. <laughs> and my favorite was chicken fiesta. And then we have some little packs, uh, cans like of pudding or um, uh, diced fruit, that kind of thing. So it's it's not too bad. It's not too bad, but you really want a cheeseburger when you come home. Can you really describe what it's like to see Earth from outer space? Yeah, that is the uh, the pinnacle of the experience. Um, the the Earth revealed in all its pastels and deep blues in the oceans. It just it's eye-wateringly beautiful, and every chance you get, you spend staring out the window. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, you've got to do. 12 to 16 hours of work every day, and it's hard to get that window time. I would stay up after my bedtime uh, and cheat on my rest a little bit just so I could get that view. And it, that's unforgettable. Think of a, uh, watching a sunset from a mountaintop, and it's a yeah. hundred times better than that. It really is and great. feeling the weightlessness and just being out in this vacuum. <laughs> you know, did you ever do an EVA? Were you ever out there? And what was right. that like? Because you're just hanging on this little limb. <laughs> Helping build the space station. Uh, did three spacewalks. And that, I think, is the, the peak astronaut experience. Um, and you're, you're out there 220 miles up, suspended above the, the Earth and the void in the other direction. And you are conscious that you're your, your own little spaceship out there. And yeah, there's a lot of work to be done, but you have to take time as a human being to yeah. step back and see that view a thousand miles out to the horizon. And what a privilege that was. And what a privilege it is to meet you. I've got to say, it is an honor. Thank you. It's an honor to shake the hand of a man who is in space. That's great to be with my spaceship here again. It is. I know. It feels good. Mike and Maria, I unfortunately talked uh, the ear off of Tom and one of the other astronauts that was with us yesterday. I need to apologize to them for asking so many questions. You could ask away all day <laughs> long, to. Stephanie. What a, great, what a great treat this morning.